Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why, and how of newspaper reading. Now we will be analyzing the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper of 18th of July 2019 and the news that would be covered today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. And so now with this, let us start with the first article. Now as part of our continued discussion on various questions that were asked in the prelims examination of 2019, the question that we are going to discuss today was on the Interpreter Agreement, whereby the question asked what was the purpose of the Interpreter Agreement signed by the Indian banks and the financial institutions recently. Now as explained in the Daily News Simplified video of 10th of August 2018, the Interpreter Agreement wanted to serve as a platform for banks and financial institutions to come together for the resolution of stressed accounts. Now this intercreditor agreement was to be applicable to all corporate borrowers who have availed loans and financial assistance for an amount of rupees 50 crore or more under consortium lending. Now from this explanation you would understand that the correct answer to this question would be D whereby the main purpose of the intercreditor agreement is to aim at faster resolution of stress assets of rupees 50 crore or more which are under consortium lending. Now apart from this as you already know Daily News Simplified videos provide various questions for practice for your prelims examination. Whereby the question for practice asked in the Daily News Simplified video of 10th of August had stated that consider the following statements related to intercreditor agreement whereby the first statement within itself is that the intercreditor agreement is aimed at the resolution of stress account with a size of rupees 50 crore and above. Whereby from this question for practice asked in the Daily News Simplified video, you would also know that the correct answer to this question asked in prelims of 2019 would have been D. Now it is through providing explanation on various articles and news that have appeared in the Hindu newspaper and then again revising them through questions for practice that Daily News Simplified videos can help you in preparing for the upcoming prelims examination of 2020. So now with this, let us move on to the first article for today. Now we have taken the lead editorial from the editorial page on page 10. Now as you already might be aware of what has recently happened is that India has become a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council whereby India has been elected as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for the period of 2021 till 2022. Now the United Nations Security Council is a part of GS Paper 2 within the section International Relations whereby the structure and the mandate of the United Nations Security Council has already been covered in the Daily News Simplified video of 27th of June whereby the earlier video highlights the functions, powers and the composition of the United Nations Security Council. Therefore if you want to understand the structure and the mandate of the United Nations Security Council then you can visit the Daily News Simplified video of 27th of June to further understand about this. Now the main focus of today's editorial is that because India has now become a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for the period of 2021 till 2022, the author has highlighted various aspects of future actions that India needs to undertake as being a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Now according to the author, India's main objective as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council should be to build a stable and secure global environment. Now India can build a stable and secure global environment through influencing the decision making within the United Nations Security Council. Now the main reason given by the author for this is that there has been a rise in security concerns around the world. Whereby these security concerns include the rise in terrorism especially by ISIS, the rise in conflict between Iran and the United States, the nuclearization by North Korea, civil conflicts within Venezuela, Syria and other countries. Now these security concerns are under the purview of the United Nations Security Council and since India is going to become a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, India would need to take decisions on such global security issues. And therefore by influencing such decision making within the United Nations Security Council, India can help to build a stable and secure global environment. Now apart from this, according to the author, India should also promote regional and global security. Whereby according to the author, what India can do is partner with like-minded countries within the United Nations Security Council on common global issues of security concerns. Now a recent example of this is that India partnered up with US, UK and France so as to declare Masood Azhar as a global terrorist in the United Nations Security Council. Now during this time, India was not a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. 
However, now that India is going to become a non-permanent member of UN Security Council, India can partner with like-minded countries so as to take a common stand on various issues of regional and global security. Now, the main achievement that would come out by promoting regional and global security is that it would ensure prosperity and global growth within the world. So let's say if India partners up with countries such as UK, France, Russia and China so as to ensure that there is no rise in conflict between the United States and Iran, then what this would ensure is that the global oil prices would remain stable. And this would be economically beneficial for India and for other countries. Similarly, by working with the United States, UK, France and other countries so as to control the growth of ISIS within South Asia would also ensure regional security within South Asia. Now the third and the final agenda which has been highlighted by the author is that the author has highlighted various steps which are required to be undertaken by India so as to achieve a permanent seat within the United Nations Security Council. Now the first step which has been highlighted by the author is to increase the financial contribution of India to the United Nations. Now currently one of the highest contributions to the United Nations funding is from the United States of America at roughly around 22%. However, India's contribution to the United Nations funding is only around 0.8%, whereby all the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, such as the United States, Russia, China, UK and France, have a higher contribution to the UN funding. And similarly, other countries such as Germany, Japan, Brazil, who are also contenders for a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council, contribute more to the UN funding than India. Now, it is within this context that the author is saying that India needs to really increase its financial contributions to the United Nations so that it becomes a strong contender for permanent seat within the United Nations Security Council. Whereby India is the sixth largest economy within the world. But India is not even in the top 20 countries who are financial contributors to the United Nations. Now, the second point which the author has highlighted is India needs to take leadership on several global issues. Now, as you already might be aware of, India has taken leadership on several global issues, whereby with China, India is one of the few countries who has taken leadership for the developing countries for climate change talks. Similarly, India has also taken leadership by forming the International Solar Alliance, which is the largest international organization which is focused on solar energy. However, within that context, the author is saying that India must take up leadership on several more global issues. The third point highlighted by the author is that India should guide the United Nations Security Council away from humanitarian intervention. Now there is a particular policy of the United Nations known as Responsibility to Protect or R2P. Now in simplest of terms what this means is let's say if there is some dictator or authoritarian government which is severely oppressing its own citizens or is indulging in humanitarian crimes such as of genocide then the United Nations Security Council has a responsibility to protect the people of that country. However, what is being seen is that the United Nations Security Council, especially the Western countries, have misused this concept of responsibility to protect, whereby several Western countries have intervened in countries such as Libya, Syria and others by saying that they are doing this since it is their responsibility to protect the people of Libya from the oppression of Muhammad Gaddafi. Similarly, they have intervened within Syria by saying that it is their responsibility to protect the Syrian people from the oppression of Bashar Assad. Now, it is within that context that the author is saying that India must take leadership in ensuring that the Western countries do not use the United Nations Security Council for their own national interest by misusing the concept of responsibility to protect. Now, you do need to understand that the responsibility to protect is a concept which is much more relevant for those who are preparing for political science optional paper. But hopefully you have understood about the concept of responsibility to protect in simple terms for your GS paper. Now the fourth point which has been highlighted by the author is that India should work with other countries so as to strengthen the United Nations Sanctions Committee. Now it was the United Nations Sanctions Committee 1267 which was responsible for declaring Masood Azhar as a global terrorist. However, what is being seen is that several countries are not following the provisions which have been provided under the United Nations Security Council Sanctions Committee. And within that context, several individuals and several groups which have been sanctioned by such sanctions committee are not being brought to justice because the recommendations are not being properly implemented. 
Now it is within that context that the author is saying that India must work towards strengthening the United Nations Security Council Sanctions Committee. Now the fifth point highlighted by the author is that India should take the lead in activating the United Nations Security Council Military Staff Committee. Now in simplest of terms, the Military Staff Committee of the United Nations is a subsidiary body of the United Nations Security Council. Now within this Military Staff Committee, it would include military representatives from the five permanent members. However, what was seen is that during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Military Staff Committee was not able to function, whereby the main role of the Military Staff Committee was to plan military operations for the UN Security Council. However, because of the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Military Staff Committee became a dormant body or a non-functioning body of the United Nations Security Council, whereby till date it has played no major role in ensuring military planning under the United Nations Security Council. Now within that context, the author is saying India can work with other countries in activating the United Nations Security Council Military Staff Committee. However, what you need to know is that the members of the Military Staff Committee are only from the five permanent members. And it is only when India becomes a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council that India can take a lead in actually activating this Military Staff Committee. Now the sixth step highlighted by the author is that India should act as a consensus builder among the great powers. Now as you already understand, the world is currently divided into two different camps, one being led by the United States and the second camp including China and Russia. Now because of the rivalry between these two groups, actions on global issues are currently not being undertaken by the United Nations Security Council, whereby the United States, UK and France have not been able to agree with China and Russia on the future action with regards to Syria, Libya and other major conflicts such as also in Venezuela. Now within that context, the author is saying that India can act as a consensus builder or as a mediator between the great powers so as to ensure that actions are undertaken by the United Nations Security Councils on major security issues. Now the seventh point highlighted by the author is that India should embrace polycentrism. Now in simplest of terms, what this means is that during the Cold War, there were two major powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And what this led to was bipolarity in global power, whereby there were two major poles of power within the world. However, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union during the 1990s, the only remaining superpower was the United States and they were the world power scenario changed into unipolarity whereby there was only one major pole of power which was the United States. Now within that context, what the author is trying to say is that India should embrace polycentrism whereby there should be major centers of power across the world whereby China, the United Kingdom, France, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria and every other regional or great power within the world can ensure that there is no form of unipolarity or having one country as the major power within the world or having only two major powers within the world. Therefore, according to the author, by embracing polycentrism in terms of power, India can ensure regional and global security whereby no one country would be able to dominate in terms of power any other country. Now the last recommendation given by the author is that India should ensure stable South Asia and have stable relationships with its neighbours. Now this is because no country can become a great power or be given the power of the United Nations Security Council if they are not able to ensure stability within their own neighbourhood. And it is within that context that the author is saying that India should ensure a stable South Asia whereby it would ensure that India is an effective regional power and thereby can be an effective global power within the United Nations Security Council. So now hopefully you've understood the three main agendas which has been highlighted by the author which should become part of India's future agenda within the United Nations Security Council. And apart from this, hopefully you've also understood the various steps highlighted by the author which are required to be undertaken so that India can achieve a permanent seat within the United Nations Security Council within the future. So now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this editorial from the editorial page on page 10. Now what is required to be understood from this article is what is the Press Freedom Index. Now before understanding further about the Press Freedom Index from the perspective of your prelims examination, let us first understand on how various questions have been asked with regards to indexes within your previous prelims examination. 
Now if you take a look at the prelims examination paper of 2019. Firstly question number 3 which had asked who prepares the global competitiveness report. Whether the correct answer to this question would be D World Bank. Or if you take a look at question number 77, which had asked which one of the following is not a sub index in the World Bank's ease of doing business index? Whether the correct answer to this question would be A. Maintenance of law and order. Whereby within the Daily News Simplified video of 1st of November 2018, the various parameters of the ease of doing business index report was explained. And from this, you would have understand that maintenance of law and order is not one of the parameters within the ease of doing business index report. When if you take a look at the prelims paper of 2018, a question was asked as to who prepares the rule of law index, wherein the correct answer to this question is the World Justice Project. Wherein if you take an example of the prelims examination paper of 2017, a question was asked as to who prepares the Global Gender Gap Index report, wherein the correct answer to this question is A. World Economic Forum. And if in similar terms, if you take an example of the prelims examination paper of 2016, it had asked as to what are the indicators of the Global Hunger Index report and the correct answer to this question is C 1, 2 and 3. Similarly it had asked as to who prepares the ease of doing business index when the correct answer to this question is C World Bank and moreover the 2016 paper had also asked as to who prepares the Global Financial Stability report when the correct answer to this question is B International Monetary Fund or IMF. Now the first thing that you need to know about the Press Freedom Index is who it is released by. Now it is the international NGO or a non-governmental organization known as Reporters Without Borders which releases the Press Freedom Index. The second aspect that you need to know is what are the parameters of the Press Freedom Index. Now the parameters of the Press Freedom Index includes pluralism, media independence, media environment and self-censorship, legislative framework, transparency, media infrastructure and one of the latest parameters which has been added in the Press Freedom Index is about abuses whereby the parameter abuses measures the amount of political violence which are committed against journalists within a country. Now the last aspect that you need to know about the Press Freedom Index was that India was ranked 138 in 2018 but now India's ranking has dropped two places to 140 in 2019. Now these are the main aspects that you needed to know about the Press Freedom Index from the perspective of your prelims examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this opinion based editorial from the editorial page on page 10. Now what had happened was that India had petitioned the International Court of Justice so as to annul or remove the death sentence that was given by Pakistan to Kulbushan Jadav. Now what has happened recently is that yesterday on 17th of July 2019, the International Court of Justice provided its verdict in the Kulbushan Jadav case, whereby this verdict given out by the International Court of Justice was on a 15 to 1 vote. Now we'll come back to this reason as to why the Kulbushan Jadav has 16 judges even though the strength of the International Court of Justice is supposed to be 15. Now the verdict given out by the International Court of Justice in the Kulbushan Jadav case was that Kulbushan Jadav cannot be executed by Pakistan. Similarly, the International Court of Justice has also said that Pakistan must provide India counsellor access to Kulbushan Jadav. Apart from this, the International Court of Justice has said that Pakistan must provide a fair trial to Kulbushan Jadav and has urged Pakistan to review the conviction that was given to Kulbushan Jadav. Now it is yet to be seen as to what would be the response of the government of Pakistan to this verdict given out by the International Court of Justice in the Kulbushan Jadav case. Now apart from highlighting as to what recently has happened within the Kulbushan Jadav case, the author within this editorial gives out the background on how the Kulbushan Jadav case came to be seen under the purview of the International Court of Justice. Now Mahek Ma'am in the Daily News Simplified video of 17th of July that is yesterday has already explained the background to the Kulbushan Jadav case. Therefore what is required to be understood from this article is of the recent verdict given out by the International Court of Justice in the Kulbushan Jadav case whereby the author has said that India must now focus on pressuring Pakistan so that Pakistan follows the verdict given out by the International Court of Justice. But within that context, the response of Pakistan is yet to be seen and therefore this news should be considered as news in transition. Now one of the aspects that was explained yesterday is with regards to the background of the International Court of Justice that the ICJ is composed of 15 judges. But if the International Court of Justice is composed of 15 judges, then why are there 16 within the Kulbushan Jadav case? 
Now what had happened as some of you might know that Dalveer Bhandari who is an Indian citizen was elected as a judge to the International Court of Justice in the late 2017. Now Pakistan has said that there is already a judge from India as part of the 15 judges of the International Court of Justice and therefore Pakistan had raised concerns of partiality whereby it was said by Pakistan that Dalveer Bhandari would be in the favor of India within this Kulbhushan Jadav case. Now within that context the International Court of Justice took a decision to appoint a former chief justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan as an ad hoc judge in the Kulbhushan Jadav case. Therefore within the Kulbhushan Jadav case it included the 15 judges of the International Court of Justice plus it included one ad hoc judge from Pakistan so that there is a balance of one judge from India and one judge from Pakistan. Therefore this is the reason as to why there are 16 judges within the Kulbhushan Jadav case in the International Court of Justice. So now hopefully you've understood the various aspects that you needed to understand about the judgment given out by the International Court of Justice. Now what we'll do is revise about the International Court of Justice from the perspective of your prelims examination through questions for practice. Now there are two questions for your practice and what you need to do is pause this video, solve both of these questions and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to question number 1 is D 1, 2 and 3 whereby the International Court of Justice does settle the legal disputes between states. Apart from this, the judgment given out by the International Court of Justice is binding upon the parties concerned. And lastly, the judgments given out by the International Court of Justice are final in nature and cannot be appealed. However, states can go back to the International Court of Justice for the interpretation of the verdict given out by the International Court of Justice. Similarly, if there is new evidence that has come up in a case, and if the judges of the International Court of Justice agree, then they can open up a previous case and give out a new judgment. Now with regards to question number 2, the correct answer is C2 only. Now it is not necessary that the composition of the 15 judges remains static in every case. Now what you need to understand that the composition of 15 judges remains static for the International Court of Justice itself. But it is not necessary to remain static in every case that comes up to the International Court of Justice. Whereby if you take the recent case of the Kulbushan Jadav case, there were 16 judges. And similarly the number of judges which are sitting on a case is not necessary to be at 15. Whereby it can be decreased or increased on case to case basis. Now statement number 2 is correct. Now a state party to a case which does not have a judge of its nationality may choose a person as an ad hoc judge who would sit on that specific case itself. Now again an example of this would be the Kulbhushan Jadav case whereby since Pakistan did not have a judge who was elected as part of the original 15 judges of the International Court of Justice. Pakistan chose a former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan to act as an ad hoc judge in the Kulbhushan Jadav case. Now within the 15 to 1 ratio in the verdict to the Kulbhushan Jadav case the 15 permanent judges of the International Court of Justice took the side of India while the one alone ad hoc judge from Pakistan was the only individual who had taken the position within the Kulbhushan Jadav case that was in favor of Pakistan. Now statement number 3 is also incorrect. Now an ad hoc judge which has been appointed to the International Court of Justice is not necessary to be of the nationality of the proposed Sayyid. So for an example in the Kulbhushan Jadav case Pakistan could have also proposed a judge whose nationality might have been Turkish or French or German or of any other nationality whereby it is up to the proposing state to appoint an ad hoc judge and it is not necessary that judge has to belong to the nationality of the proposing state and it is within that regard that the correct answer to this question is C2 only. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this opinion based editorial from page 11. Now what has happened is that the government has introduced the banning of cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill of 2019. Whereby under this bill the government has proposed penalties for holding, selling or dealing in cryptocurrencies. Whereby various government bodies such as the income tax department, the CBDT, the customs department have also endorsed this bill which has been introduced by the government of India. Now what you need to understand is that the cryptocurrencies currently work on the blockchain technology. Now according to the author if the government of India bans cryptocurrencies then India will fall behind on the blockchain technology whereby the blockchain technology currently within the world is currently mainly being used around the world for cryptocurrencies. 
Now what you need to understand is that the government of India is only trying to ban cryptocurrencies which are mainly used for illegal purposes. And the government of India is not banning blockchain technology in itself. And therefore Indian technology firms and Indian researchers can continue to work on blockchain technology. Whereas several banks within India including public sector banks such as SBI has also proposed of using blockchain technology for securing financial transactions. Therefore this argument of the author if cryptocurrency is banned then India will fall behind in blockchain technology has not been provided with reasons within this opinion based editorial. But nevertheless the author has given their European example whereby the author is highlighted as to what Europe has done with regards to regulating cryptocurrency. Now the author has highlighted various points from the European models for regulating cryptocurrencies that India can follow. Now Europe has proposed that exchanges and wallets related to cryptocurrencies should use Kanoyo customer norms. And apart from this such exchanges and wallets also need to be registered with the government. Apart from this companies working on cryptocurrencies also need to report suspicious activities to the government that might be undertaken with the help of cryptocurrencies. Similarly Europe has also proposed a self declaration scheme under which individuals or companies which are holding cryptocurrencies need to tell the government themselves. And lastly one of the major aspect of the European proposal is that there should be a central database of all transactions that are undertaken through cryptocurrencies. Now what you also need to know is that the implementation of this European model has been first proposed till 2020 and some of the measures would be undertaken or implemented by 2022. So it is yet to be seen on how Europe is going to implement KYC norms, self declaration schemes, central database with regards to cryptocurrencies. Apart from this what you should also know is that the banning of cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill of 2019 is yet to become an act. So therefore let us wait and see as to on how the government of India moves forward with regards to this bill. And within that context both the European model and the Indian model with regards to regulation of cryptocurrency should be considered as news in transition. But hopefully you understood the main focus and the crux of this editorial. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 9. Now what has happened is that the central government is going to introduce the dam safety bill of 2019. Whereby this dam safety bill has been cleared by the cabinet committee on economic affairs. Now apart from this what this article also highlights is that the cabinet committee on economics affairs has also approved 1600 crore investment within the Dibang multi-purpose project within the state of Arunachal Pradesh. Wherein this Dibang multi-purpose project within the state of Arunachal Pradesh would be India's largest hydropower project. Now the dam safety bill of 2019 should be seen from the perspective of GS paper 3 first within the section economic development and within the subsection infrastructure while it should also be seen from the perspective of disaster management and within the subsection disaster and disaster management. So now let us understand the various features of the dam safety bill of 2019. Now the bill intends to help all states and union territories to adopt uniform dam safety procedures. Now these dam safety procedures are there to ensure the safety of dams and also to safeguard human life, livestock and property. Now under this uniform safety procedures it would include firstly regular inspection of dams. The second safety procedure it would include is of emergency action plans. The third safety procedure would be of comprehensive dam safety review. The fourth safety procedure it would include would be a fund for repair and maintenance. And the fifth and the final uniform safety procedure would be of instrumentation and safety manuals. Now hopefully up till here you've understood the purpose of the dam safety bill. Now let us understand the main features of this bill. Wherein this bill intends for the formation of a national committee on dam safety. Wherein the main objective of the national committee on dam safety would be to evolve dam safety policies and recommend necessary regulations on dam safety. The second main feature of the dam safety bill of 2018 is the formation of the national dam safety authority. Now the main function of the national dam safety authority would be that it would be a regulatory body to discharge the functions in implementing the policy guidelines and standards for dam safety in India. Now the third feature of this bill is the formation of a state committee on dam safety. And similarly there would also be a formation of a state dam safety organization. 
Now, both the State Committee on Dam Safety and the State Dam Safety Organization would be formed by the state government. And lastly, one of the main features of the Dam Safety Bill of 2018 is that the onus of dam safety lies with the dam owner. Now, you have to understand that this Dam Safety Bill of 2019 has been approved by the Union Cabinet and is going to be introduced within the Parliament of India. But within that context, you have to understand that this news is currently in transition. We will have to wait and see as to in what final form the Dam Safety Bill of 2019 comes out. But hopefully you've understood in brief the various features of the Dam Safety Bill of 2019. And so now with this, let us move on. Now we have taken this article from page 22. Now what has happened is that the World Health Organization has declared that the Ebola outbreak in the country of Congo within the continent of Africa is now become a global health emergency. Now this global health emergency is a rare designation which is given out by the World Health Organization and is only used in the rarest of rare epidemics. Now the main reason as to why the Ebola outbreak in the country of Congo has been declared a global health emergency is because it has spread to the city of Goma in Congo which is the first case within the world of the Ebola outbreak spreading to an urban center. Now what generally happens is that when an epidemic of disease breaks out in a rural area, it is easier to contain. Whereby the number of people who are living within a rural area and the number of people who are migrating from that particular rural area to other areas is quite low. But when a disease outbreak happens in an urban area, especially within those urban areas, which have access to airports, railways, border crossings, then there is a strong chance of that particular disease epidemic spreading to other parts of the world. Now, it is within that context that the Ebola virus has spread to the urban center of Goma within the country of Congo, whereby the city of Goma within the country of Congo has an airport, it also has railways, and it is also connected to various neighboring countries such as Uganda. Now this is the reason as to why the World Health Organization has declared this Ebola outbreak in the country of Congo as a global health emergency, whereby there is a strong chance that it can spread to other neighboring countries of Congo within the continent of Africa. Now what is required for you to understand from this article are various facts about the Ebola virus and we are going to understand various facts about the Ebola virus with questions for practice. Now there are three more questions for your practice and what you need to do is pause this video, solve all of these questions and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now when it comes to question number 3, there are two ways in which the Ebola virus is transmitted from animals to humans and from humans to human. And in both of these scenarios, it is human to human transition which causes most of the cases of the transmission of the Ebola virus. Apart from this, currently, there is no proven vaccine or treatment so as to treat the Ebola virus, whereby all of the vaccines currently are in trial phases. Therefore, the correct answer to question number 3 would be C, both 1 and 2. Now, with regards to statement number 1 of question number 4, the Ebola virus is mainly confined to the African continent, in particular the countries of Congo, Sudan and other countries of Central Africa. However, some cases of Ebola has been found in Italy, Spain, but these cases are quite small. Now, the origin of the Ebola virus is yet unknown. However, it is currently known that fruit bats are a host of the Ebola virus. Now, in an epidemic of the Ebola virus, it is only through laboratory testing that it can be known whether a person is infected with Ebola virus or not. Therefore, with regards to question number 4, the correct answer would be D, 1, 2 and 3. Now, with regards to question number 5, the World Health Organization has said that there are three groups of individuals who are at the highest risk during an Ebola epidemic. First are health workers who are working with infected patients of the Ebola virus. Second are mourners who may have direct contact with the bodies of individuals infected with the Ebola virus during burial rituals. And lastly, family members who remain in contact with either items or the surrounding environment of an individual who is infected with the Ebola virus. Now an easier way to understand this is that any individuals who is most likely to come in contact with the bodily fluids of a person infected with the Ebola virus, then that individual is most likely to be at higher risk of also being infected with the Ebola virus. Therefore the correct answer to question number 5 would be D, 1, 2 and 3. 
Now, these are the eight main statements that you needed to understand about the Ebola virus from the perspective of your prelims examination. And now with this, we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today. 